My guest today is one of the deputy floor leaders in the Oklahoma House of Representatives, the Honorable John Pfeiffer. Representative Pfeiffer, how are you, sir, today? I'm good, Scott. Thanks for having me on. There was a 127-page article in Nondoc this week, one of my favorite publications in our state, Trey Savage, that uh, Megan Prather had done about this issue about property taxes, wind farms, pipeline companies, and all this money that's not getting to schools. And I'm reading some of this, and this is an incredibly good story, very much in detail, but way over people like me. And I'm trying to figure out, you know, that old saying, I'm from the government and I'm here to help, or government <laughs> intelligence, those sorts of things like that. Some of this stuff looks like, right. you know, just like make a phone call, you can fix this. Okay, well, we're, this is the way we've always done it. It's activate, it triggers me, right? To say this is how we've always done it. Mm -hmm. Could we start with a, at a 10,000 foot level, uh, Representative Piper, and you're the point guy trying to fix this problem. And it has a lot to do with there are 77 elected officials called tax assessors in this state. And then there are the treasurers, which are elected. And it has the, it has the definition. It seems almost like that old movie from the sixties. It's a mad, 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 mad world. Um, <laughs> and when you're dealing with bureaucracy plus elected officials, try to get something done and nobody wants to pay taxes. Well, Nobody really says they want to pay taxes. And then there's the assessment <laughs> on the value. You know how difficult this is. You're trying to unwind oh, this yeah. thing. It's like the Christmas yeah. lights at, in the, the movie uh, Christmas Vacation. You're trying to undo this uh, wad of lights. You're the point guy. Give us an idea of what the problem is that we're facing and how it affects Oklahomans. Sure. Uh, th this is a problem we've worked on for the last couple of years. Uh, and like you said, it's, it's not an, not an easy fix because it is a lot of moving parts, a lot of, a lot of complicated things to go in with this. Uh, the easiest way, uh, to, to kind of understand it and, and to start thinking about it is just thinking about your house. Uh, we, uh, like you said, Scott, we have 77 County assessors. Their job is to go out and place a value on property. Uh, that, uh, so for whatever it is, you you know, your house is worth, uh, $300,000, uh, and they place that value on it. And then it gets run through the formula, depending on, uh, what your county tax rate is, what your county assessment ratio is. Uh, and then a couple months later, after they assess the value, you get, a, you get a letter in the mail, uh, from your county treasurer saying you owe this much in property taxes based off your property. Um, and wind farms, pipelines, uh, any, anything in the state, any property in the state uh, or any real tangible property goes through the same process. County assessors uh, value it. Uh, they run it through their formula, um, again, which is the, the tax rate and the assessment ratio. And then, uh, then the county treasurer sends you a tax bill. Uh, what we've seen, um, we, we also have what we call centrally assessed things, which is assessed uh, by the tax commission uh, those are big statewide projects, uh, big uh, in industrial utility uh, concerns and things like that are assessed at the state level by the tax commission and not by their local county assessors. Um, and, and it follows the same, same uh, basic value. They go out, they assess the value, uh, it gets approved, they get taxed. Um, and because we have 77 county assessors, all of which was set up in our state constitution, they have a constitutional right um, and have a constitutional ability to place values on their property. And because they're in the constitution and the grain of the constitution, no one can tell them how they value that property. Um, you, you find that out pretty quick in, in conversations with assessors uh, when you start working on this, that, that they want you to know that it's their constitutional duty and they're the ones who get to place value on things and you're not allowed, and we're not allowed per the constitution to tell them how to do that. Um, so because Oklahoma uh, has a diverse energy background, um, we, in, and because of some of the limitations put on just by the simple budgets in these county offices, it's hard for everybody to be an expert in everything. Um, they're, you know, they, they have a lot of expertise in uh, measuring and valuing properties, houses, things like that. Um, they don't have as much experience sometimes, and sometimes it becomes even a little harder to find things like pipelines because they're underground or it, it becomes harder to start placing values on big uh, wind assets uh, and wind turbines, especially when you have um, 
the blades that are worth a certain value, the hub that's worth a certain value, uh, and the stand and the concrete and everything that it stands on placed at a certain value. Um, to add another layer of complexity to this, everything gets depreciated out. Uh, so from the day from the day you build a house, uh, it gets wear and tear on it. It starts losing value as it depreciates further out. Uh, the same things happen with oil and gas assets, pipeline assets, uh, and and uh, wind turbine projects. Um, the it gets a little more complex than just and a lot harder to figure uh, because everybody has you know we we have pretty standard operating. Uh, procedures for, okay, you put a roof on a house, it's supposed to last this many years, here's how much value is still in it. It gets a lot more complex uh, when you're dealing especially with wind turbines, uh, when you have blades made in one place, hubs made in one place, um, you know, some of them shipped, uh, some of them made out of the country, shipped over here and, and built out in the middle of uh, western Oklahoma. It becomes hard to kind of place those values, especially when you realize that different parts of the machine uh, depreciate out at different rates. So for a long time, wind energy uh, was able to qualify for the manufacturing tax credit exemptions. And this is something that the state offered to all manufacturing uh, entities. So if you came in and you built cars, tractors, widgets, whatever, the state would basically pay your ad valorem taxes as an incentive to encourage manufacturing to get here in the state of Oklahoma. When we first started, when we first started uh, building wind turbines in the state, and this was many, many, many years ago, long before I was elected, uh, the the incentive review, or not the incentive review commission, but um, the, the people in charge of the tax incentive programs said, okay, wind industry, because, you know, we're building the turbines here, we're, we're manufacturing, they qualify for the manufacturing tax credit exemption. We've since ended that um, uh, by about four years ago now. Uh, but it, it kind of builds into how we get into this problem. So for things that qualify for the manufacturing tax credit exemptions where the state pays your ad valorem, the state tax commission then is the one who places a value on the property because the state's the one paying, the state tax commission is going to be the one valuing, valuing that property and, and paying it back. So we have the state tax commission um, valued, valued these wind turbines for, I think it was, and it was close to about 15 years, uh, and they qualified for ad, valor or ad valorem exemptions for five years before they rolled off. Um, and so the, the state uh, was in the business of valuing these turbines, and the depreciation tables that the state tax commission used to depreciate out these wind turbines were different than the, than the depreciation tables that the counties used to depreciate out wind turbines. And this is something that we've known has been a problem. We've tried to get... Uh, well, since I've been here, at least two different governor's offices to try to work on to fix, try to get the tax commission to fix it. Uh, because we have ended the program, this problem is just going to end up taking care of itself because eventually I think we're in like the last year to 18 months of any program uh, that, of the state being on the hook for any wind program because they're not going to, uh, we'll finish up paying the last little bit of what we owe. They don't qualify for manufacturing exemptions anymore. Um, so, so the program's going away for that industry and it's just rolling off and, and not going to be an issue. Uh, the companies that own these wind projects have always claimed that the values placed on them by the tax commission were too high. Um, the tax commission ruled that they didn't have standing to protest the valuation uh, because the state was the one paying the ad valorem taxes in these years where they got the tax exemption. Um, so you've got a company who owns something, the state's paying the tax bill, the state's doing the assessment, the state's telling them they don't have the ability to, to challenge the valuation for how much their project's worth because they're not the ones actually paying, uh, paying the taxes. And it hadn't been a problem until they roll off and they no longer qualify for the manufacturing exemptions. They start getting, uh, they start getting valued by the counties. This, uh, so this would be the first time in, in these years uh, that they had to say, hey, the values they're placing on our property is too high. And again, I think it's important to remember uh, the ability to protest your valuation and protest basically your property taxes uh, is, is one of Oklahoma's in, you know, more sacred rights that's enshrined in, the state of, uh, in our state constitution. Uh, it's no different than if the tax commissioner, uh, tax assessor came out to my farm and said it's worth $15 million. I know for a fact it's not worth that much. 
I can appeal it, I can protest it, and then it goes, um, and then it goes to the County Board of Equalization. Uh, wind companies, pipeline companies, anybody has that right. And so that's what we're, that's what we've seen in the last, uh, you know, three to five years, it's really started to become a major problem. As we've seen more and more of these companies that have rolled off the state paid ad valorem uh, manufacturing exemption, started hitting the, the county tax rolls. The counties and the local schools have always gotten that tax money. The difference is now the state's not paying for it anymore. It's up to the companies. And this is the first chance they've got to really say, hey, our valuations are way too high. They're taking advantage of their constitutional right uh, and going first to the County Board of Equalization and then on to district court. Where okay, this, so this sorry. is the point where I, I want to play uh, Waylon Jennings doing the Dukes of Hazard song. You know, this is a good old boy. Because now you've got, and you hit it on the head. Now, forgive me for interrupting, but which is, nope. it's, you can hear that kind of in the background. You ain't going to tell us how to do our job down here, boy. All right, right. right. When you yes. start hearing that, when you're talking about 77 different elected officials. So you have uh, 77 different folks. The the thing in the, and by the way, the non-doc story has a really good description of how the property tax protest works, but staying on the, and I'll come back to that, but on the 10,000 foot level, the way this works is it's, it's got a bunch of money dedicated to schools or headed for schools in escrow and they can't touch that. And that's where I keep hearing well, we can't, you know, right. C A I N T E. So the way you spell it, <laughs> we can't do this. We ain't never done it. This. That's not the way we've done it. So it's hurting some schools the way they've done it. But it it does seem to me that somebody could go, hey, do it different. A am I wrong? No, I no, Scott. I don't think you're wrong. And, and that's where this this where this has really become a problem. So what happens when when myself or or you or or you know, an energy company or anybody else protests their taxes. Uh, it goes to an informal protest in front of the uh, county board of uh, county board of equalization. A lot of residential uh, homeowners, things like that, uh, which is the vast majority of property taxes in the state, gets resolved there. Uh, if neither side can come to a, an agreement in the informal process, it goes to district court. And what ends up happening is you pay those property taxes and instead of then getting distributed distributed out because it's you know it, we don't know who's right on on the valuations and how much tax to pay is it the assessor or is it the company that says you know their one farm's only worth you know half of what what the assessor saying is they take the full amount of taxes they put it in an escrow account that sits in the courthouse and it sits there uh in, until this matter is resolved now again when when it comes to you know local property and stuff that doesn't make that much of a dent when we're dealing with millions of dollar uh, really big tax bills it becomes a little bit of a problem because the vast majority of ad valorem taxes go to fund our local school districts and and that's where we've really seen the problem and so to kind of help explain this a little bit uh the, the way school funding works uh everything starts at the local level so your local ad valorem taxes uh go to your local schools um, and it's been that way since since we've since we've had uh, had schools and ad valorem taxes in the state of Oklahoma. And then what we do uh, at the state level is come in and appropriate uh, appropriate a bunch of money, and then money comes off the top, and it all runs through the state Department of Education and gets distributed out um, on top of their ad valorem through the state funding formula. So the state funding formula was to try to even even out all school districts across across the state. Um, you know, just because some place had a, a bunch of wind turbines or a bunch of oil fields and some place doesn't have a lot of manufacturing or anything that generates a lot of ad valorem revenue, everybody would kind of get funded at the same rate. The problem with this becomes um, the way the state funding formula works is they get reports in uh, from, from the county treasurer's office that says, all right, Mall Harlando Schools, which is my home school, is going to collect X amount in ad valorem taxes. State, State Department of Ed says, great. They plug it into the funding formula, uh, automatically knows how much they need to, uh, how much in state money they need to uh, send out to make sure it evens out with everybody else across the state. What happens, though, is when somebody protests their ad valorem taxes, 
it doesn't show up. It never makes its way up to the State Department of Education. That money that's under protest is sitting in an escrow account in the courthouse, isn't, access, isn't accessible to anybody. So you've got schools, uh, like a whole lot of them in my district, that are saying, we're supposed to be getting $3 million in ad valorem money. But turns out we're only getting 500000 in ad valorem money because two and a half million of it's sitting in an escrow account because it's under protest. And they're also not getting their state funding formula money because as soon as they send the report up, um, as soon as they send the report up to the State Department of Ed, the State Department of Ed takes them out of their portion of the or takes that out of their portion of state funding. And so I've got a lot of school districts that get in really serious binds when they're supposed to a vast majority of their budget uh, is tied up in, in a courthouse fight, and uh, it, it's made for some very very strong and, and tough situations that a lot of our administrators have have handled um, in, in some they've had to get creative about how to do it. I've I've had at least I've had at least one school in my district that's had to take a loan out from a local bank just to make payroll. It gets even more difficult when you start talking about sinking funds and bond issues uh, because bond issues are um, you're allowed to bond X amount of what your property taxes are worth. Um, but if your property taxes is is sitting in an escrow account uh, and then come to find out you get a decision that rolls against you, then that impacts your sinking fund. And so it's, I mean, we get into some really in-depth stuff in school financing that that is tough to kind of navigate through. And unfortunately, because of, because of the times we find ourselves in, sometimes we have uh, new superintendents move in that aren't used to dealing with these kind of things. They get caught short. Um, I do know that's something I've worked with uh, COSA, which is their state school administrator group, trying to do a better job of letting these superintendents know, just be on the lookout for this because this is something that, that could happen so they don't get caught in a situation where they're not getting any local taxes, they're not getting any state funding, and they don't have a funding source. Uh, so it, it, is, it is a difficult situation. You would think that a modicum of common sense could break out at the State Department of Education. Uh, and sorry if that sounds mean, but I've been, I've been working on this for three years now, uh, and it's something that greatly impacts. I've got 18 school districts uh, in, my, in my house district, and at any given time, it's impacted about 15 of them. And, and we've had trouble, uh, I and mean, we already know the funding problems schools have, and when you take out a vast majority of their budget, um, it, it just makes it even more difficult. They're, unfortunately, because the state funding formula works well, everything's kind of on auto drive um, with, with computers and automation and things. Uh, we've got all these reports and everything. It just kind of automatically generates. And so we've, well, we've lost that ability or we've been able to find a way to make it to where a person could step in and use a little bit of common sense that says, hey, Mall Orlando School District, turns out they're not getting $3 million. They're only getting 500000 We need to make that up with state funds. And we've been working, again, with the State Department and COSA on that. We just haven't found the solution quite yet to make that happen. They, they do only hold a, a portion of it. Um, a, a certain amount of an agreed upon portion does go ahead and get distributed out. Uh, the problem that we've seen is because after the informal protests uh, fail and it goes to a formal protest, which is in district court, this problem just compounds on itself. So it's, I, it, it's not all the fact that they're getting, um, you know, they're not getting all of their taxes in one year. It compounds because we've got cases going back in some cases five to seven years uh, because they've just never, they, they've never been settled. Uh, they've never, uh, they, they haven't, they, they just got behind. The court system moves slow at times, uh, especially on, on something like this that is a little more dry and technical. And, and so you've got a problem that, you know, maybe it's just 500,000 this year, but then it compounds and it's 500,000 next year, next year, next year, next year. And, and it just keeps building and building and building. Uh, we've got several, uh, you know, it, it, several schools, districts that are waiting on ad valorem for five years ago. Uh, to the point that, I mean, in, in terms of what's being protested right now is about $80 million, give or take, across the entire state. Uh, now, that's not all from this year. It's just all that's built up uh, that, that had not been solved. In some cases, uh, every year we'll see, we'll see some, uh, the county assessor will get together with whoever's protesting their taxes and they'll settle that. Uh, some of them want to take it to court and fight it out. And these things just keep dragging on and dragging on. And so it keeps, it keeps building. And we're finally starting to reach a critical, critical point that if we don't 
if we keep just doing things the way they've always been done, it's going to be unsustainable for these rural schools. Um, and so if we don't either change, change the way we handle it or, or reach some kind of agreement on, on how we, you know, on how we handle these protests going forward, th this problem is just going to keep getting bigger and, and, and keep growing. And it's ultimately going to cost every, everybody, uh, including all the schools, uh, schools more money because I mean there's there's a limited amount of dollars in the pot that have to go to all school districts across the state um, so theoretically in, in in history the way it's always worked is when a school district increases the amount of ad valorem money it gets it, it's a great thing for all the schools because they don't need as much state aid it allows more dollars to go to others to go get spread out and go to other schools uh, who don't have as much ad valorem property tax in their base uh, if these things keep getting protests and if we can't figure out a way to speed this process up and get them resolved quicker eventually we're going to have to start spreading that money around to some of these schools that normally wouldn't need as much state funding or in some cases are 100 percent off the funding formula anyways just because they don't have enough money to do their normal operations one more thing before we get into uh, solutions the one more aspect of the non-doc story was that while you talk about the the local assessors talking about their autonomy and you can't tell us how this is our job you can't but a bunch of them are using one person to set the value and then there was further troubling aspects of the stories there are ways about setting value and then in the story quotes uh, a, a lobbyist talking about the consultant saying well i'll tell you what i got a number in mind you get a number let's meet halfway in the middle which is now i want to start playing that Waylon jennings song about good old boy <laughs> stuff which is like yes consultants we've seen it in COVID. That is usually not a good outcome when it comes to the interest of the taxpayers. So you've got all of this going on. How big a contributor to the problems are, is this sorts of things where you're starting to use these consultants? And listen, I'd be interested to see what kind of money they're making. What do the contracts look like? Again, a whole different kettle of fish. But the fact is right. you started this hearing in September. You're trying to get to the bottom of that. I mean, how do these things like this, it's called the good old boy system, how how difficult does that make it for you and the legislature to get to a solution? I, I think it makes it extremely difficult, and I think um, part of the problem with this with this whole thing is is some third party consultants. So county assessors have the ability. Again, we talked about not being able to know everything about everything. Um, so through statute, they have the ability to go in and, and hire people to help them help them set values. What we've seen is one company uh, really being the ones that most everybody uses, especially uh, in, in some of these high protest areas, which have a lot of oil and gas and and uh, and wind valuations in them. The, the the basic premise was pretty simple, right? And they'd come in and they'd go to a county assessor and they say, we can help you raise more money because we can find things in your county. At that time, it was mainly pipelines. We know you've got pipelines that aren't getting reported, they're not paying their taxes on them. So we can come through and we can, you know, sign a contract with us. We can help you find find these assets, place values on them, and and raise raise your valuations and overall raise uh, raise your revenues and go to your schools and go to your counties. That's where it that's where it started. Uh, and then after a while, there was no more assets to find uh, because we found them. And and a lot of the stuff has gotten a lot easier because of technology. Uh, because you know we now have access to geotagging, we have access to aerial maps, things like that uh, that we haven't had in the past. So, so technology and, and being able to help county assessors better use that is what the the intention of the law was. Where we've seen um, it, it's almost to the point now where it's a battle of personalities, which is something that's that's never good when you're trying to set policy. Um, but but that's kind of where it's got to because you have one main county. Uh, county contractor that has gotten crossways with a lot of these companies. And so there's three main ways you can value assets. Um, you can value them on the income-based approach, which is how much income they can bring in. Uh, you can value them based off how much it costs to build. Uh, so, you know, again, you think of your house, say it costs $300,000 to build your house and, and product. Uh, that's how much it costs. Or, and I believe you, the other way to value it and um, it's been a while since I've looked at all three of these. I'm, I'm not a county assessor, but I believe it's like the knockdown value or replacement value. If you had to build it back today, how much would it cost? So one of the things that, that I've worked with the wind industry on and, and worked with OSU on and their agriculture economics department is 
maybe trying to look at look at how we value these programs uh, or and value, especially when it comes to wind farms, because right now we're valuing everything either on how much it costs to build or how much it would cost to replace and then depreciating it out from there, uh, which is great in about a 10 year time span. So you've got a bunch of schools that get a just huge chunk of money for the first 10 years, right? Because they, they've got, uh, you know, everything's new. It's not depreciated out. Uh, that, that's why you see, and especially, you know, throughout uh, North Central, Northwestern Oklahoma, they get these big wind farms and all of a sudden they got money. They're able to build a new gym uh, that they haven't, you know, they haven't been able to replace since the WPA built their last one. Uh, all because of this wind farm money, it's a big, big glut of money. That's all great for about 10 years. And then the parts of the, and then the parts of these turbines start depreciating out, their value falls, and, and they're kind of back, uh, back to a lower level of valuations. And so they're not getting as much money. Um, if uh, there's, there's a ag economics professor I've worked with at OSU who's pitched the idea of making it based off a, based off the income based approach. Um, and the easiest way to think about this, hotels and motels are not taxed by how big they are, or how many rooms they have. They're taxed off, uh, their property taxes are based off of how much money they make or their basic level of income. So if we did this with, say, wind, for example, you wouldn't get as much money up front in the first 10 years. But what you wouldn't see then is big fall downs uh, after these assets have been depreciated because the wind's still blowing. They still got these contracts. These things are still going. And so instead of seeing the big ups and downs in terms of uh, in terms of valuations, you've just got a steady stream of income coming into the schools, coming into the counties. Um, that's where we get into the process. Um, you, you talk a little bit about, you know, don't tell me how I'm going to do things. That's that's where the county assessors. Uh, and again, I, I have a great relationship. I work with them on a lot of different issues, uh, but they get a little touchy because it is their you know, their right to do their job for the Constitution, and they don't think the legislature should be telling them how to do it and making them switch over. They constitutionally can't make them switch over the income-based approach. Okay, and, and that was kind of been my mode on how to fix this the last two years, trying to find, even though we can't tell assessors how to do it, trying to find that happy medium, that perfect kind of formula on how to do an income-based approach on a wind farm putting it in state statute as an example for everybody to use who wants it. There's just too many variables depending on counties and there, there's gotta be other ways to fix this problem. Over the course of the past two years, as uh, the wind industry has tried to meet uh, with the county assessor groups and the third party, uh, the third party uh, contractor who helps them, they, who just keeps button heads with them. There was a there was a comment made in one of the meetings that has really gotten held on to is well, there's a fourth way to make the assessment, uh, and it's you know it's not based on on anything really. It's you throw out a number, I throw out a number, and we negotiate down to a middle. Which, as anybody, I I would imagine anybody who pays taxes, if they came out and did that to your house and said, well, why don't you tell me how much you think your house worth? I'll tell you how much I think it's worth, and we negotiate down. It's a great way to buy used cars. It's not a great way to value assets in the state of Oklahoma. And whether that was a flippant comment made in jest or not, that's something that's been held onto. And so these kind of personal issues as we try to work through this has definitely added an, another layer of difficulty. Um, and, and so the, the question really becomes now, how do we move past this and, and how, do we, how do we move on and get going and, and get solutions? Because at the end of the day, Local schools don't care whether the, the guy the assessor contracts right. with made win, you know, made some, you know, executives at wind mad or not. They just want their money so they can pay bus drivers, teachers, everything else. Yeah, I think that I'll be looking forward to media. Somebody doing open records request. Let's find out what's in those contracts. I mean, that's something that people ought to know. It'd be just fine. But, you know, back to Wayland. There's some read those lyrics on good old boy, the Dukes of Hazard song. It's it's really some of this stuff just looks like home cooking. Representative it, it, it is, and it's I mean, we, we, we talk a lot about how important county government is because we know it's important, but unfortunately a whole lot of us don't pay that much attention to it. Because I mean, we it, like a lot of things in, in politics, it's not nearly as exciting or fun to dig into ad valorem taxes. My poor wife just started just sticking her fingers in her ears when she hears the word ad valorem get tossed around, which is about two or three times a night in our house, because uh, she's just tired of hearing about it. Because it's you know it's not fun and exciting; it doesn't make the news a lot, but it's something that impacts everybody. 
And I just, you know, as a society, something we maybe should pay a little more attention to. Okay. There's a lot to unpack here, but let, let me get to the uh, Representative Pfeiffer end of this thing. You had that hearing on the 22nd of September. You're just trying to negotiate all the personalities and you know, recording a series with Secretary Ming right now. We're talking about energy and you know, he, he talks about how that legacy systems and moving forward, how they, they fight each other in these silos. It's just terrible when you're trying to make progress for society. Having all this, all right, 77 assessors and money held in escrow and heads buttoned together and energy sources that don't like each other and politicians and bureaucrats. <laughs> <laughs> the, the question is, what can you do? What are your colleagues wanting to do? How can we understand what you're trying to do in a way that you can go forward, put this issue behind it in, in an equitable way? Well, I should start with, that's the first question. Second question is, every, do you think everybody's working in good faith? I, I know all the, the representatives and stuff that are that are trying to work on this, and, and it's not just me. I mean, it's it's representatives from all over the state are because at the end of the day, I mean, we we're here to be fair. We're not here to pick winners and losers. We're just here to get the process and make it work again, and try to get the money back flowing to the schools and to the counties uh, where it belongs. Um, and, and as far as everybody else, in terms of industry or county assessors or, or their contractor. Um, Again, I think the county assessors are uh, because this has become a problem with them. Everybody else, I mean, they've they've got their own interest, and that's their job to look after look after their company, look after their clients, uh, look after their assets, things like that. I mean, that's that's their job, and and I, it's something that especially when you start hitting into some of these bigger energy companies, they that are publicly traded, they've got a fiduciary responsibility to look after their products because they're it's owned by all their shareholders. So, I mean, everybody here. I think it's just trying to do their job. Now, that being said, everybody wants it, you know, they, they want it their way. And, and unfortunately, that's not how negotiations go. We're going to have to work through this and, and figure out a way that, that works and is fair to everybody. Uh, some of the things we've been looking at, number one, is trying to make sure, we, we talked about trying to bring some common sense into the state funding formula, trying to figure out, maybe insert some more human interaction in the funding formula, take it a little bit more off automatic and give our local schools the ability to say, hey, I've got this much money tied up in protest. We know for sure it's not going to get settled anytime soon. Can I please have my state funding formula money so I can make payroll and then say this gets settled, figure out some way I can pay it back. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's that's number one because this is the biggest uh, the biggest bump of this ad valorem taxes is going to schools and those are the ones that are getting getting hung up the most. Uh, the next thing we're trying to look to do figure out a way to make the informal process work a little better. Try to keep these things out of court. Try to make it aware um, we can get documents uh, documents faster. So when these people, uh, these two kind of warring factions, the, the energy company and the county assessor go before their county board of equalization, they're able to actually figure things out. And whether that's monkey and then changing the timeline around a little bit, uh, actually specifying what documents are needed when, just trying to make that process a little better so maybe not everything winds up in court and then the the other thing i know that i've i've really looked at we talked about centrally assessed assets that are assessed by the tax commission that then uh, are approved by the state board of equalization well say something like that gets uh pro their value gets protested then that goes to what's called the state board of tax review uh, instead of district court so i've been working with the court systems trying to figure out exactly how the how the state board of tax review works. It's not something that gets used an awful lot and looking at the option of kind of finding that break between residential and commercial in terms of assessments and then keeping all the residential stuff, uh, which again, a vast majority of that gets settled in the informal process, uh, keeping it at the district court level and then taking all the commercial stuff, the higher stuff that's more complicated, uh, there takes a lot of time and moving that away from the district courts and moving that into the state court of tax review and we find ourselves in the very enviable position of having money in the state of Oklahoma which hadn't always been the case uh, during my tenure but finding that finding what level of appropriation they need so we can appropriate money to the state court of tax review and say listen we've got this backlog of cases and let's go out there here's your money work hard and let's get these things settled get these rolled off and get all these protests settled and get this money out of the out of these escrow accounts and back to doing the business it, it back to doing the business it needs to and i think 
if we can start both sides, um, whether they're the taxpayer or the assessor are saying, we want these things solved. Uh, because nobody wants, you know, a, a, the, the company doesn't want this, uh, what they are considered a false valuation hanging over their heads and nobody wants a long drawn out court battle. Um, you know, the only, <laughs> it, it's, it's been a little funny. All the counties use the same lawyer and all the companies that protest their taxes use the same lawyer. Uh, so these long drawn out court battles are really only benefiting two people. Um, so we're trying to figure out a way to and to make this faster. Ideally, we'd like to get it down to where we can settle these things. I would like to say six months. I'd love to get it at least a start to a year and get it to where we we set the precedent. We find out uh, from from a court uh, that that also has a little more experience uh, in these matters than just than just at the district court level and start getting the proper valuations, have some precedent to build on, and then start turning these cases around longer so they're not jogging on five, five to seven years at this point. And so we could just, I think if we could get that moving and, and get these proper values settled, get it, get it settled in court and start cleaning these cases up, maybe we could get out of this cycle that we're in where we're just, you know, year after year after year wind up in these protests because they still haven't ruled on their valuation uh, from five to six years ago.